pray together, stay together. Help me to welcome. This is Jennifer Livingston. Wow. Good morning, friends. Vance, thank you for that introduction. Wow. Let me also add my own words of welcome to all of you and very especially to those tuned in on the internet. I want to thank Vance for the beautiful treatment of oneness to set the tone for the remainder of the service. And always, it is truly a pleasure to share with you from the podium on a Sunday morning in whatever capacity I'm assigned to do. So this morning as I got up, one of my readings said, um, it was from Louise Hay, Heart Thoughts, and it said, I'm in the right place. And I'd like for us to affirm that together. I am in the right place. And to your neighbor, say to them, you are in the right place. You are in the right place. Yes. So I believe that we are in the right place this morning. And I'd like to begin with a story that some, if not all of you, may have heard before, but it's worth repeating. A very religious man was once caught in rising flood waters, so he climbed onto the roof of his house and trusted God to rescue him. A neighbor came by in a canoe and said, the waters will soon rise above your house, hop in and we'll paddle to safety. No thanks, replied the religious man. I have prayed to God and I'm sure that he will save me. A short time later, the police came by in a boat. The waters will soon be above your house. Hop in and we'll take you to safety, they said. No thanks, replied the religious man. I have prayed to God and I am sure he will save me. Still, a little time later, a rescue services helicopter hovered overhead, let down a rope ladder and said, the waters will soon be above your house. Climb the ladder and we will fly you to safety. No thanks, replied the religious man. I have prayed to God and I am sure he will save me. All this time, the flood waters continued to rise until soon it reached above the roof and the religious man drowned. When he arrived at heaven, he demanded an audience with God. Ushered into God's throne room, he said, Lord, why am I here in heaven? I prayed for you to save me, and I trusted you to save me from that flood. God said, yes, you did, my child. And I sent you a canoe, a boat, a helicopter, but you never got in. The story, though humorous, makes the point about prayer and the answer to our prayers. And so my talk this morning is entitled, Living a Life of Prayer. Dr. Holmes, the founder of this great teaching called The Science of Mind, in his book entitled Prayer, How to Pray Effectively, states, and I quote, Prayer is not an act of overcoming God's reluctance, but should be an acceptance of his highest willingness." End quote. Friends, there is a place in us which lies open to the infinite, but when the Spirit brings its gifts by pouring itself through us, it can only give to us what we take. It is difficult then to believe in a God who cares more for one person than another. And similarly, there can be no God who is kindly disposed one day and cruel the next. Dr. Holmes goes on to state, God is a universal presence, an impersonal observer, and a divine and impartial giver, forever pouring himself into his creation." End quote. Therefore, Prayer must be constructive because it enables us to establish closer contact with the fountain of wisdom, and we are less likely to be influenced by appearances around us, as stated in John 7, verse 24, 
judge not according to their appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Which means that we should not be faced by any manifested form, but we must judge according to the truth of things. When we pray aright, we set the law of the spirit of life in motion for us. Friends, prayer then is essential, not to the salvation of the soul. For our soul is never lost, but in our communion with the infinite, there is a vitality which is creative, and which delivers to our highest, and which delivers to us our highest good. Dr. Holmes also states in this book on prayer, how to pray effectively. He says, this conscious commingling of our thought with spirit is essential to the well-being of every part of us. End quote. For most, if not all of us, who believe in God, we believe in prayer. But we must bear in mind that the prayers which are effective, no matter whose prayers they may be, they are effective because they embody certain universal principles which, when understood, can be consciously used. Here at the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living, as with all centers for spiritual living worldwide, we teach spiritual mind healing treatment or affirmative prayer. This is a five-step process, which in our communion with God, it takes us through the stages of one, recognition, two, unification, three, reaffirmation, four, thanksgiving, and five, release. There are no first-time visitors with us here, so you would all have known about affirmative prayer. But if you would just like to be reminded of the steps, then this is a good time to join any of our classes being held here at the temple. And please see our list of significant events in the order of service for further details. That's a free plug for classes. Prayer, then, is a spiritual process, as we are told in John 4 and verse 24. God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is our true spiritual power, knowing that is the Father within that doeth the work. When we become conscious of our oneness with universal good, belief in lack and limitation tend to disappear, and we no longer ask amiss. That is, supplicating as though God were not willing to bestow our good upon us, or begging as though he were withholding. Friends, Jesus, the master teacher, states, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. John 15, verse 7. This is one of the important laws governing prayer that of abiding in him, which means we should have no consciousness separate from his consciousness. In other words, there should be nothing in our thought which denies the presence and power of God. Even if we may find ourselves in a situation such as this, a journalist was assigned to the Jerusalem Bureau of his newspaper. He gets an apartment overlooking the Wailing Wall. After several weeks, he realizes that whenever he looks at the wall, he sees an old Jewish man praying vigorously. The journalist wondered if there was a publishable story here. He goes down to the wall, introduces himself, and says, you come here every day to the wall. What are you praying for? The old man replies, what am I praying for? In the morning, I pray for world peace. And then I pray for the brotherhood of man. I go home, have a glass of tea, and I come back to the wall to pray for the eradication of illness and disease from the earth. 
The journalist is taken by the old man's sincerity and persistence. And he says, you mean you have been coming to the wall every day to pray for these things? The old man nods. How long have you been coming to the wall to pray for these things, the journalist asks. The old man becomes reflective and then replies, how long? Maybe 20 or 25 years. The amazed journalist finally asks, how does it feel to come and pray every day for over 20 years for these things? How does it feel, the old man replies, it feels like I'm talking to a wall. <laughs> I know that none of us feel this way about our prayers. <laughs> and so in the power of prayer, a presentation by Reverend Mary Madden Morrissey, she defines prayer as an act of communion with God. And in this communion, she states, that the thoughts we send out through our focused attention becomes our experience. It is that focused attention that becomes our prayer. It is a step-by-step -step daily experience in living a life of prayer. Friends, our prayer life is more than the 20 minutes we take every day to do our meditations, our daily prayers, when we are living a life of prayer, we pay attention to our thinking as our thought patterns constantly creates our experiences. Reverend Mary Manning Morrissey also shares with us that in living a life of prayer, we usually go through four stages. In the first stage, she states, we want a God who who is out there to do something for us in our life, and we tend to put this God far away from us. In the second stage, we recognize that we do not come from a state of wanting to get this thing or that thing out there, since God, since good without God is just O, oh, nothing can happen for us which does not happen through us. In the third stage, she states, we are moving into a more mature thinking, and we remind ourselves that there is no being out there that fulfills our needs, but that we have this guidance within. This is the still, small voice. And in the fourth stage, we move into the birthing of our ideas. It brings us into something greater than that which have gone before. We are also told in John 14 and verse 13, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. This, friends, is another statement of truth. If we are recognizing our oneness with God, we cannot pray for other than goodness for ourselves and goodness for all. We should therefore pray believing that we have already received as stated in Isaiah 65, verse 24, before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. This passage tells us that even before our request is made, God has already answered. When we act from this belief, then we have no time to concern ourselves about the outcome, as we know that the right outworking always takes place. If, however, our prayer is one of partial belief, then there is only a tendency towards its answer. And if we fully doubt, then there will be no answer at all. In dealing with mind, we are dealing with a force we cannot fool. We must learn to go deep within ourselves and speak to the presence there that knows. It is worthwhile for us to commune with spirit, to sense and feel it. But the approach to spirit must be direct through our own consciousness. We may consider the approach of this little boy who was kneeling beside his bed with his mother and grandmother and softly saying his prayers. 
Dear God, bless mommy and daddy and all the family, and please give me a good night's sleep. Suddenly, he looked up and shouted, and don't forget to give me a bicycle for my birthday. There is no need to shout like that, said his mother. God isn't deaf. No, said the little boy, but grandma is. <laughs> there you go. Through the words of a little child. <laughs> Friends, Joel Goldsmith, in his book, The Heart of Mysticism, states, those who live and move and have their being in God consciousness, those who pray without ceasing, are the people who find that the spirit of the Lord descends upon them. And through this spirit of God, they are able to heal, they are able to comfort the mourner, they are able to supply the hungry, and they are able to bring joy to the sorrowing. He goes on to state, wherever God is entertained in consciousness, there is where the spirit of the Lord is. But when we permit hour after hour of the day to pass without a conscious acknowledgement of God's presence and power, without recognizing God as the source of our life, we are living as though we are completely cut off from God." End quote. Friends, we can be certain that there is an intelligence in the universe to which we may come that will guide and inspire us. It was Ayan Lavanzant who said, and I quote, in my deepest, darkest moments, what really got me through was a prayer. Sometimes my prayer was, help me. Sometimes my prayer was, thank you. What I've discovered is that intimate connection and communion with my creator will always get me through because I know my support, my help, is just a prayer away. End of that quote. Indeed, knowing that God is just a prayer away, I will share with you this beautiful poem written by Grace Nassens, and it's entitled, The Difference. I got up early one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish that I didn't have time to pray. Problems just tumbled about me, and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me? I wondered. He answered, you didn't ask. I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on gray and bleak. I wondered why God didn't show me, he said, but you didn't seek. I tried to come into God's presence. I used all my keys at the lock. God gently and lovingly chided, my child, you didn't knock. I woke up early this morning and paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to take time to pray. Friends, I invite you now to close your eyes and join me in a meditative chant. God is the wind, we are the sea. I ride on the spirit dwelling in me. God is the wind, we are the sea. I ride on the spirit dwelling in me. God is the wind, and we are the sea. I ride on the spirit dwelling in me. God is the wind, we are the sea. I ride on the spirit dwelling sin. God is the wind, and we are the sea. I ride on the spirit dwelling in me. God is the wind, and we are the sea. I ride on the spirit dwelling in me. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you. You can open your eyes. In closing, I leave you with this quote from Dr. Holmes' book on prayer. Every day and every hour, 
we are meeting the eternal realities of life. And in such degree as we cooperate with these eternal realities in love, in peace, in wisdom, and in joy, believing and receiving, we are automatically blessed. Our prayer is answered before it is uttered. Namaste.